Jesus lives out Proverbs perfectly, and Proverbs is, in many ways, it is the life to the full that Jesus speaks about in John chapter 10. And today I want to think about how Jesus helps us to figure out our emotions. Proverbs has a lot to say about emotions. It is a book that's full on. It talks about joys and sorrows and miseries and delights and anticipated pleasures and disastrous pleasures and all sorts of things. And I wonder if I was to ask you, I mean, how do you feel about your emotions? I mean, are you an emotional person? Even the question seems weighted, doesn't it? As if to say you're an emotional person is something suspect. Well, someone once rebuked Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher, for his laughter and his humour, which they thought was a bit excessive. His answer was, well, if only you knew how much I really restrain. Well, I think, you know, people may have been misled that there's some sort of idea of holiness, that emotion is a sign of uncontrolled behaviour. Jesus certainly was not a person who lacked emotions. Visibly, it was clear through the gospel records of his love that is expressed, his delight, his sorrow, weeping, his joyfulness at the good, his sense of pity and compassion that overflows towards people. You can't read the epistles either and fail to be struck by the expressions of emotion that the apostles and the writers declare in their words. Take, for example, Paul's words in Philippians 1 when he says, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ. I mean, can you imagine yourself coming up to someone in church and saying, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ, or a contemporary way of saying that? And yet, what would be wrong with that? Proverbs describes for us how the gospel alters our way of understanding our emotions. Or as Ray Ortland put it in his excellent book on Proverbs, here in Proverbs he says, we have Jesus' wisdom for our emotions, our squally emotions, our negative emotions, our dead or distorted emotions, or our excessive emotions. You see, Proverbs urges both action and restraint in the proper measure. Because our emotions are really the pulsating desires or the outward expressions of the desires from within our hearts. They're very strong. And at the same time, as an unredeemed heart uh, acts, it will act with the, in this, it'll act in a different way, going in a different direction, driven by those desires. The desire for joy will, will lead, can very easily lead to two very different expressions of emotion for a fallen heart or a redeemed heart. And it can often be the means of great disaster for some. I mean, you take, for example, the desire for approval that some people have. And that's not, there's nothing wrong to have a desire for approval or significance. We are designed to have that. But if it goes in the wrong direction, how tragic it can be. Do we open our hearts and our lives, surrender them with joy to the Lord Jesus? When we do, we see the wisdom of Proverbs as the very water to the thirsty. So listen then to what the Proverbs say to the emotion of anger. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is a glory to overlook an offence. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Go back and take Proverbs 19.11 there. Good sense makes one slow to anger. But from where do you get good sense? You see, Proverbs teaches slow burn anger. It teaches the wisdom of overlooking an offence. It teaches that it's wise to consider the outcomes of our actions. And I think it's all talking about gaining insight, foresight, which is a gift of grace. It's about how we see things. 
where does the good come from in the sense? There's bad sense. There's good sense. Well, I think that we see this. A gospel-changed heart is given the capacity to discern the good in the sense from the bad in the sense. Think about anger in Jesus. Jesus was angry too, but his anger was always expressed in a way that was appropriate. Now, you might not consider his turning over the tables in the temple as, an, as a proper expression of emotion of anger. But I think it most likely was. We, we need to understand what's going on in that story to fully appreciate what he did. And, of course, he allowed the full justice of God to fall upon him, a perfect anger at sin to fall upon him so that we'd be delivered from the sinfulness of our anger. And yet look at Jesus in other situations when he's provoked or deceived or betrayed or humiliated. He's quiet. He's wise. He sees ahead. He knows what people don't know. He has the capacity to look upon things in a different way. His heart is shaped by what he knows, by the way he sees things. And when he sees the sad reality of what the people are doing, He doesn't react the way we would because of this heart that he has. By a gospel change, by the work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts, we see all things new. We know God rules. We don't need to be God in other people's lives. We don't try to be their Messiah because we know we can never. We we learn not to condemn and judge wrongly and act in, in, in a wrong anger. You see, the work of grace then helps us to restrain anger when it's wrong. And it also helps us to express anger when it's right, in the right way. The changed heart can now see the wisdom of he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. God changes our hearts and that, at the very seat of all our desires, changes the way our emotions respond. Take another emotion of envy. When we hear ourselves speaking condemningly, maybe, or, you know, judgingly about another person or negatively, we can often discern the reason maybe I'm doing that is is, is maybe because I'm envious of where, where they are. We might speak disparagingly of the thing that they have or the position that they have or something about them. And you know, as well as I, that this is not a happy place to be. And when we express that sort of view, that emotion of jealousy in that way, even though we couch in all sorts of nice kind of, you know, I'm only saying this because I think I'm trying to think, well, good for them and so forth. What we what we do is we just sour the atmosphere. We just turn the temperature of joy way below zero. And nobody wants to live there. You don't want to be with me if I do that. And I don't want to be with you if you do that. Understanding the love of God for us. The gifts of Jesus' death for us fills us up so much if we really embrace the gospel so so that we will have little sense of need for other things. I mean, the value we place on them becomes so much less. Why do we lift them up to such a height when we have already discovered the heights of what the Lord has done and won for us? This enables us then to discover what this passage talks about, a tranquil heart a tranquil heart. And that is such a blessing. And tranquility, of course, it's the fruit of grace. So then what about this final emotion as we come to the end? The emotion of joy. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. It's what makes you happy. When you get all you want, or when the Lord adjusts your wants. A changed heart changes the desires and the wants. And I think it's wonderful then to just see how the Lord in his grace, by changing us in our very natures, helps us to discover the sources of joy, new sources of joy in himself, so that we can find ourselves having a joyful spirit in times even when others would be so surprised, just like the Apostle Paul, praising God, when imprisoned, having been suffering punishments and persecutions. Isn't it a wonderful challenge, this? And there's so much more that we can do, but our time is gone today. But I just encourage you to consider 
just these wonderful words in view of the wonderful gospel. And I pray the Lord will bless you and I with our emotions today.